Welcome back to Complex Analysis. So today we're going to get into what's known as the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Now this is a result that is probably the first time as an undergrad taking complex analysis I was like, oh, something really cool is going on with complex land that didn't really happen in calculus. Um, so in any case, I think this is just a really cool, awesome result that's super, super helpful and super just, just it's just cool. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, now recall, there we go. I'm changing my color. Uh, recall that complex numbers on their own have different representations, right? We can think about a complex number and well, your book says five different ways. I kind of call it four, but in any case, we can think of a real number or a complex number as sort of in its standard form Z in its rectangular form X plus I Y. We can think about it as a point in two dimensional space where we have the real and imaginary axis, or we can think about it in exponential or polar form. Okay. Now what we're going to focus today on are these two. Okay. So just like we have with complex numbers, complex functions can be thought of or represented in different ways as well. So for instance, if f of z is equal to or is some complex function, then if we make the substitution z is equal to x plus i y, then our function is going to become a, a function of two variables. So this is going to be a function of x and y. So it kind of brings it back to a calc 3 scenario. Although you will have i's in it, but you still will be, in, again, sort of like a calc 3, 2 variable function setting. So let's look at some examples. So if we're dealing with the identity function, f of z equal to, not identify, it's actually called the identity function, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so if we're dealing with f of z equal to z, well, if we make the substitution z is equal to x plus i y, then this just becomes x plus i y. Okay, so now it's a function of two variables i and y. Similarly, if we look at f of z equal to z squared, our quote unquote quadratic, we have f of x plus i y. So again, making that substitution is equal to, well, x plus i y squared. And if we simplify this further, this will be x squared minus y squared. I got to think about it a little bit, plus i times 2xy. Okay. But again, we have a function now of x and y. Okay. So it's a two variable function. And then lastly, we have the conjugate function. So if we substitute x plus iy, what do we get out of this? We're going to get x minus iy. So again, a function of two variables. So the point of this is, because we have different representations of complex numbers, this induces different representations of your complex functions. So instead of viewing our complex functions as a function of z, a single variable function, we can view it as a function of two variables and sort of use our calc three um, knowledge to our benefit. OK. So what's the extremely cool result? Okay. So the extremely cool result, and this is something I don't think is intuitive unless you read through the proof and you're like, okay, yeah, I guess that's true. Um, but there's a relationship between the complex derivative f prime of z and its partial derivatives f sub x and f sub y. So what we're saying here is the regular old derivative that we were computing in the last video can be related to the partial derivatives, and I mean partial in like the calc 3 sense, um, it can be related to the partial derivatives of f with respect to x and the partial derivative with f of f with respect to y, which is kind of insane. We're thinking about this derivative, okay, f of, uh, or the derivative of f of z, right, which is just, again, sort of like it's, it's just regular old derivative, but somehow it's connected to the partial derivative with respect to x, meaning the derivative in the x direction and the derivative in the y direction, okay? Now, I'm not going to say exactly what this relationship is just yet until the next slide so I don't have to write it down. Boom. Okay. Now, I'm calling this Cauchy-Riemann equations. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more, like what are actually the Cauchy-Riemann equations. We'll, we'll get to that. But here's our result, though. So theorem 2.13, there's two parts. So this is kind of a beefy theorem here, so bear with me. So part A says the following. So suppose f is differentiable at z naught. So that means that let me write here in the upper right, f prime of z naught exists. So if your function's differentiable at z naught, then we get the following. 
So the partial derivatives of f, so if we think about f in terms of a two-variable function, a uh, two-variable function of x and y, then we get the partial derivatives of f exist okay, and satisfy the following equation. So the partial with respect to x is equal to minus i times the partial with respect to y. Okay. So that's part A there. So if, you're, if your derivative exists, then you automatically know the partial derivatives exist. And more importantly, well, maybe not more importantly, but more um, interestingly, the partial derivatives satisfy this equation, f sub x equals minus i f sub y. Okay. Again, something that I, I don't feel like is that intuitive, but kind of awesome, though. So if you have a complex function, and as long as you're differentiable, then that means that there's a nice relationship between the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y. All right, part b. So part b is kind of a converse, although I think it's a little bit stronger. So suppose f is a complex function such that the partial derivatives, so f sub x and f sub y, exist in an open disk that's centered at z0 and are continuous. So we kind of have a lot in our hypothesis there. So we have a function f, and we know that f sub x and f sub y exist on some open disk. Let's pretend like I actually made some dash lines here. OK, let's pretend like that's a circle. Uh, z0. So they have to exist on some open circle centered at z0, and they have to be continuous as well. So as long as you have that, all those conditions, okay, if these partial derivatives satisfy this equation here, f sub x equal to minus i f sub y, then you actually know that this derivative up here, f prime of z0, exists as well. Okay? So if you know that your partial derivatives exist okay, on this open disk and they're continuous, and if they satisfy this equation, and by the way, I'm saying equation in a weird way because I'm trying to relate it to Cauchy-Riemann equations eventually. Um, if your partials satisfy this equation here, then you know that this derivative up here, your quote unquote full derivative exists as well. Okay, So that's part B. Now again, I just want to point out A and B are not converses of each other because this hypothesis here in B is pretty strong. Okay, your partials have to exist on an open disk, whereas in A, you just have to be differentiable at a single point. In any case, and this is a, another thing that sort of blows my mind as well, or at least used to until I had actually studied this and figured out why this is true. Um, in both cases in A and B, f prime, so f prime of z here we're saying, is given by just the partial of f with respect to x. So what this is saying is as long as... Um, your partial derivatives satisfy this equation, then to find your derivative, f prime of z, all you have to do is take the partial with respect to x and call it a day. Isn't that insane? That's so crazy. To find this derivative, all you have to do is take the derivative with respect to this other variable, and you are good to go. Um, so what we're going to do in a little bit, we are actually going to prove a. The proof of b is kind of intense, so I'm not going to worry about it. But part a is pretty pretty down to earth, so we'll see that in a little bit. In any case, let's look at some examples, though. So let's go back to our identity function, quote unquote, um, quadratic and our conjugate function. So if we look at f of z equal to z, let's make our substitution x plus i, y. So we get x plus i, y. So let's note a couple of things. Well, first of all, we know that the derivative Okay, of this function is, by the power rule, just the number 1. Okay. On the other hand, if we look at our function in this other representation, x plus i, y, well, let's calculate the partial derivatives. f sub x is equal to 1, which that's what the theorem was saying, right? The derivative, these are equal. Amazing. And f sub y is equal to i. Okay. And note, 1 is equal to negative i, times i. Because remember, we have that relationship, right? We have f sub x, as long as you're differentiable, f sub x is equal to minus i f sub y. And so if you do this calculation over here, you're going to get 1 is equal to minus 1 times minus 1, which hopefully everyone agrees with that is indeed 1. Insane, right? This is so cool. Um, let's look at the quadratic function here. So we have f of x plus i y is equal to x plus i y squared. 
which as we saw in a couple slides ago, this is equal to, if we simplify it, x squared minus y squared, I got to think now, plus i2xy. <clears throat> now you might be like, why am I writing i on the outside like this? We'll get to that. I'm actually trying to hint at another sort of quote unquote representation, but we'll get to that in a little bit. In the meantime, though, let's think about this again. So what is f prime of z in this case? Well, again, by power rule, this is 2 times z. Okay. Boom. Not too bad, right? Now, if we look at the derivative of our different representation, and if we take the partial with respect to x, what do we get? We're going to get 2x plus i2y. Okay. And you might be saying, wait, I thought that was supposed to be equal to what we got up here. Well, it is. We just have to be a little bit more careful. Factor out a 2. So we get 2 times x plus i, y. But what is x plus i, y? That's just z, right? So we do, in fact, get 2z as our, our result does tell us. So again, the derivative, as long as you're differentiable, it's actually equal to the partial with respect to x. We get the same thing here. Now let's just verify that equation that we have up here in the upper left. Well, f sub y in this case would be minus 2y plus i2 times x. Okay, And again, I'll let you guys try this, but it is true that f sub x is equal to minus i times minus 2y plus i2x. Okay, If you do this calculation here, you will see that you do get this right here, OK? Try that on your own, though, just to see. But it is true, I promise you. Now we come to this function here, which I kind of have purposely not talked about too much, although we did see something like this in a video, right? I think it was that function. Um, actually, it might have been this, conjugate squared. Get rid of these modulus here. Something like that. But in any case, um, you may have been wondering, what's the derivative of the conjugate of z? Okay, because we have this nice formula. We have this power rule, right? At least if we're just in a, or if we're differentiating z to a power. But what happens if you try to differentiate the conjugate of z? Well, it turns out that this actually the derivative of this does not exist. F prime in this case d n e. Probably bad form to put equals DNE, but in any case, the derivative of this function actually doesn't exist. Now, how do we see that? Well, we can actually use our result. Um, well, we can use the contrapositive of our result. PowerPoint will actually let me. Okay, so what I want you all to focus on is part A here. Now, for those of you that have taken um, discrete math, which I think everyone should have at this point, or if you've, if you've taken 322, I want you to think about the contrapositive of part A. So the contrapositive of part A says the following. So if f sub x does not equal minus i f sub y, then f prime of z does not exist. Actually, I'm just going to leave off the not there. D and E. So again, if the partial of x with or if the partial of f with respect to x doesn't equal minus i partial of y, so it's the negation of this equality here or this equation. So if this is not true, then the derivative of f with respect to z does not exist as well. So this is the contrapositive of part a here. Now what does this allow us to do? Well, let's go back to our function here, which I'm claiming the derivative doesn't exist of, and let's well, let's convert it to um, its rectangular quote unquote representation, x minus i, y. And now let's see. So, what is f sub x? This is equal to 1. What is f sub y? This is equal to minus i. And I want you to notice that 1 is not equal to minus i, which the minus i is coming from our equation here, times minus i, okay, which is our partial with respect to y here. And just to show you that that's not true, well, if you actually calculate this, the minus signs cancel out, then you're going to get i squared. But what is i squared? i squared is minus 1. And 1 is definitely not equal to minus 1. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that this function here, conjugate of z, uh, doesn't have a derivative. 
Kind of crazy, right? But anyway, that's why I didn't talk about the derivative of the conjugate, though. If anyone was wondering, like, what, what happens when you differentiate this? Because you might look at that and you might say, well, maybe it's 1 because the derivative of z is 1. Well, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. It does not exist at all. OK. Um, so another thing, and uh, I, I want to build up to what's called the cauchy riemann equations, because I haven't actually said what they were yet, right? I've been sort of hinting at this equation, but how do you actually, what are the cauchy riemann equations? So the cauchy riemann equations are built out of the following idea, OK? So complex functions can be written in terms of their real and their imaginary part. So given any function, let's just look at f of z equal to z squared just as a, you know, a, a concrete example, we could write this as, by sub making our normal substitution, this was x squared minus y squared, and this is why I was writing it kind of funky, i times 2xy. Okay? So given a complex function, we can always write it in such a way that we're sort of pulling at the real and imaginary part. So for this function, this right here would be our real function, or what your book's labeling it as u. So this is the real part. And the reason why it's the real part is that it has no i in it. It has no imaginary part. So this is the real part, or u of x sub y, or u of x, y. And then this right here would be its imaginary part. Okay. So given any complex function, we can always write it in terms of its real part and its imaginary part. OK, now why am I bringing this up? Well, this is what's going to give us what's known as the cauchy riemann equations. OK, so it, with this new notation, so again, we're writing f as u plus iv. Then what this means for us is that the partial of f is just, well, the partial of u plus the partial of v, right? That's because that's what derivatives do. They distribute over a sum. Similarly, the partial of f with respect to y is just u sub y plus i v sub y. And again, that's coming from, well, if you take the derivative of this with respect to y, derivatives distribute over sums, right? So you're just going to get the derivative of this with respect to y, which is u sub y. And then the derivative of this with respect to y would be i v sub y. Okay. Anyway, it's probably going into a little bit more detail than necessary. Yeah, absolutely necessary. OK. So where do we could get with the cauchy riemann equations? So in this language, okay, we can come up with equations that mimic those equations from our result. Remember, I feel like recall is a really strong word because we just saw this. But in any case, recall that f, uh, if your function is differentiable, f sub x is equal to minus i f sub y, right? So in this new language, this is what we're going to get. Okay. So first, let's go ahead and calculate the right-hand side with this new notation. So if we have f sub x is equal to i f minus i f sub y, this means that u sub x plus i v sub x, it's the right-hand side here, is equal to minus i times u sub y plus i v sub y. Okay. Now if we distribute the minus i into this, what do we get? That u sub x plus i v sub x is equal to... Okay. So we'll get minus i u sub y. And then now what is minus i times i? This is just going to give you plus 1. So we get v sub y. Okay. So now if we look at this equation, remember the way complex numbers are equal to each other means that their real parts have to be equal and their complex parts have to be equal. So if we look at this equation here, okay, well, what's the real part? The real part on the left-hand side is u sub x. And the real part on the right-hand side equals v sub y. So this tells us that u sub x equals v sub y. Okay. Now if we look at the imaginary part, okay, on the left, the imaginary part, the stuff with the i, is v sub x. And then over here on the right, the imaginary part is minus u y. So we get v sub x is equal to minus u sub y. Okay. And these right here are what are known as the Cauchy Riemann equations. Whoops. These are the Cauchy Riemann equations. Let's 
So now we have plural. We have two, two equations here. u sub x equals v sub y. So the partial of u with respect to x equals the partial of v with respect to y. And the partial of v with respect to x equals minus the partial of u with respect to y. So again, these are what's called the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Now again, in, in the, in res, with respect to the, the result that we still had, we get the following. So if f satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann equations, okay, meaning we have that these two equations are true, uh, then our function is differentiable. f prime of z exists. Okay. So another way of sort of testing whether your function is differentiable or not is verify that the Cauchy-Riemann equations are true. And if you can show that, you're good to go. So kind of like this, again, this still blows my mind, but the differentiability of a function sort of hinders on the equality of these two equations. Like if these are true, then you get that this derivative exists. Really, really cool. Okay, so for the rest of the video, what I want to do is I want to go into the proof of part A. Uh, the proof of bar, part B is a little intense, so we're not going to do that, but I at least want to prove part A since that, as we saw, had a lot of meat to it. Okay, so let's prove part A. So what we're going to be assuming is that f is differentiable, so that means that f prime of z exists. And then what we want to show is that, well, the partial of f with respect to x, or f sub x, is equal to minus i times the partial of f with respect to y, or minus i f sub y. Okay, So we're going to assume this. And then we want to show that this is true. Okay. All right, so how do we prove this? Well, again, let's suppose f prime of z exists. Okay. Now remember, what is f prime of z, though? f prime of z is a limit, right? It's the limit as z approaches z naught, f of z minus f of z naught, all over z minus z naught. Now we're supposing that this limit here exists. So if we sort of think about our our point x naught living in the complex plane, which I attempted to draw but failed spectacularly at. Oh. All right, so here's our complex plane over here on the right. And so let's say z naught is like, I don't know, maybe it's like over here or something. Okay, now remember for a limit to exist, that would mean that if you take the limit along any path okay, to that limit, that would have to exist as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to be sort of clever with this. And we've seen this trick before, but what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and let delta z equal z minus z naught. Okay. Now you might be like, why would you ever want to do that? Well, it's going to change our limit. Our limit here then becomes the limit as delta z. Okay. So if z is going to z naught, what does delta z go to? That'll have to go to zero. Okay. It'll change it into this z naught plus delta z minus f z naught all over delta z. Okay, now you might be like, great, what's the point of that? Well, okay, so now, we're go now we've changed our limit to delta z going to zero, right? So in our picture over here, we're going to the origin. Now remember, for a limit to exist, that means that it has to exist on every path to that point, right? And that's what we're assuming. We're assuming this limit exists. So if I think of any path, our limiting values have to be the same. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to be really clever and we're going to pick the paths that give us the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y. Okay, so since this limit exists, it has to equal the limit. Now, so what we're going to do is we're going to approach 0 from the real axis. So we're going to approach it from this way. I.e., if we approach it from the real axis, that means that delta z here, which you can think of as delta x plus i delta y, if we think about approaching along the real axis here, that means that delta y is 0. But delta x is going to 0. 
So this is the limit as delta x goes to 0. Again, the reason why it's delta x, if we're traveling along the real axis delta y here, that's 0 because we're we don't have any imaginary part. And since we're going to 0, that means that delta x has to equal 0. Okay. So what does that do to the inside of our limit? Well, it's going to change it into f of z0 plus delta x minus f of z0 divided by delta x. Okay. Well, if we write this, this um, our function here in, in multivariable notation, okay, we actually get something awesome that comes out. So I'm going to rewrite this in multivariable notation. So z0 plus delta x, what is this equal to? This is equal to um, x0 plus delta x plus i y0. Okay, if we write z0 equal to x0 plus i y0. Okay. So if we substitute that into our function, this means that we can change this into, okay, what's our real part? Our real part is x0 plus delta x, comma, what's our imaginary part? Y0. Why not, right? Minus f of x0, y0, all over delta x. Okay. Now you might be like, well, why, why are we doing this? Why did this help? Well, if you remember your calc 3, what is this right here, this limit? This is actually the partial derivative with respect to x. That's what, that's what the, the partial derivative definition is for, for partial derivatives, at least with respect to x here. Okay, so what did we get? We got that f prime of z is equal to f sub x. Okay. By again just being very clever on paths. I feel like a lot of things in this class go back to, to calc 3 in those paths, right? Okay. So we, we've showed part of it. We have that the partial with respect to f exists, and we kind of got something even more special. We got that the derivative of f with respect to z is actually just the partial derivative with respect to x. Remember, that was sort of the last part of our result. All right, well, what about the partial with respect to y? So we're going to do a similar thing. So we're going to, again, we're going to assume that f prime of z is equal to the limit as z approaches z naught, f of z um, minus f of z naught over z minus z naught. And again, we're going to make the same substitution. We're going to be tricky. We're going to let delta z, which we know in the back of our heads is delta x plus i delta y. We're going to let uh, delta z be, in this case, kind of like what we did earlier, z minus z naught. Okay. So if z is going to z naught, that means that delta z is going to 0, just like last time. So this changes our limit into limit as delta z approaches 0 of f of um, z naught plus delta z minus f of z naught over delta z. Now the way we get the partial with respect to y, we kind of do the opposite Thing. So if, if you recall from the partial with respect to x, we traveled along the real axis, right? Now we're going to travel along the imaginary axis. So we're going to go down this way. Okay, we're going to approach 0 from straight down, right? Now if we're going this way, well, this means that, first of all, delta x equals 0, since we don't have a real part. We're, all, we're on the imaginary axis. And if we're headed to 0, that means that i delta y equals 0 as well. So what does our limit become? Our limit's going to become limit as now i delta y goes to 0 of f of z naught plus i delta y minus f of z naught over i delta y. OK, because again, delta x is 0 if we're on the imaginary axis. and uh, I not, whoops, not equals 0 is going to 0. I delta y has to be going to 0. Okay. Now, if we do the same shift, if we think about z naught as x naught plus i y naught, okay, and we change our representation of this function from complex to multivariable, this becomes limit i delta y goes to 0 of 
Okay, so if we add to this plus i delta y, our real part's just going to be x naught, and then our imaginary part will be delta y plus y naught. Okay, minus f of x naught y naught over i delta y. And then now we sort of have the same trick that we had last time. If you remember your uh, multivariable calculus, this is essentially the partial derivative with respect to y, except we have an i in the bottom. But remember, 1 over i is equal to minus i. If you're not unsure of that, verify that, but that is true. 1 over i is minus i, so this limit just becomes minus i times the limit, f of x naught delta y plus y naught minus f of x naught y naught all over, whoops, i went away, delta y. And that's exactly equal to, again, if you remember your pre-calc, I'm not pre-calc, uh, calc 3, this is just minus i times the partial with respect to y. Kind of really, really cool. All it is is it's just playing a game on the paths. And you actually get a really, really cool result. So again, I feel like it's one of those things, if, you, if you're first looking at it, it's really mystical and just amazing, right? And it still is amazing, but once you kind of look at the proof, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. But I feel like it's one of those things that's not intuitive until you actually kind of work through the proof a little bit. In any case, that's it for today. Uh, next time, we're going to be talking about um, a result that we get in complex analysis that we do get in, in calculus, and that's if you have a function whose derivative is zero, then that function should be constant. But we're going to have to prove it slightly differently because we actually don't have the mean value theorem yet like we did in calculus. So we're going to have to be a little bit more clever, which it's, I like this, this proof here because it's kind of getting at that a little bit. But we're going to have to pull another trick out of our sleeves. All right, everyone, that's it. I'll see you all later.